Good morning. We are continuing our study into the, <clears throat> excuse me, into the book of James. This last, um, this last time we finished up the, the wisdom from above versus the wisdom from below. We talked about how this was such a crucial part of the book of James. It may even be the peak of the book, the, the part of the book where all of what James is, is trying to put together in his larger uh, epistle comes together and forms the the basis of his the basis of his talk his main message um and and, and while i think that at the end of, of james 3 that's what you have in those in those five verses i, I think a similar thing can be said about uh what we're going to look at today and it's really a, a a similar message this choosing one of two ways uh the last time it was focusing on wisdom the wisdom that comes from above uh, which we've seen in other places is uh, the, the the father gives these the, the father from above the father of light gives these these gifts um, from above uh, and how we're to choose that and how we're to follow that instead of following our own earthly wisdom which is also demonic well in this we're we're told in this section that friendship with the world is enmity with God and that's something that we <clears throat> need to focus very much um, our, our our entire uh, life on is choosing to follow the Lord, choosing to follow um, his way, his plan, versus following the way of ourselves, which James again and again and again equates with the way of the world and the way of Satan. And so that's where we're, that's where we're going today. This this uh, next session, once we, once we finish up today, we'll move into uh, the, end of, the end of chapter four. But with that said, let us take a quick look at the the passage uh, on the whole. And I, I had some fun putting this together because I, you can really trace the argument of what James is, is, is doing here. Very similarly, he begins the whole sequence with, with a, a guiding question, which he answers. That is exactly what we saw last time where he starts, you know, who is wise among you? And then he gives the answer. And here he does the same thing. What causes fights among you? Then he gives the answer. And then he goes and describes um, in kind of an exposition the types of quarrels and fights that they experienced. He then even really doubles down and says and explains to them that the reason why they have these quarrels, the reason why we have these fights is because they have friendship with the world instead of the friendship with God. He then gets in, into really a roadmap, a path to exaltation. Uh, which I, I really love the way that this is put together because we have this string of commands or imperatives which all result in a believer humbling themselves before the Lord and the Lord exalting, uh, exalting them. And so this, this is a, a passage that preached well, it preaches well. Why do you have quarrels? Well, it's because you're worldly. It's because you go after uh, the, the world's power, the world's desires. But then he gives us a, a way out. He shows us the path of righteousness. And so with that, let me go ahead and uh, let me go ahead and read this section. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? And so notice we have the question and then the answer in the form of a question here. Again, James likes to teach in this way, and it's very, very effective, we must, we must say. He then, again, gives this exposition here, and I just want us to focus on the words that I've highlighted in red. These are all negative terms, negative terms throughout this, throughout this text. But we'll see that this section is uh, connected with the, the Ten Commandments. He says, you desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. He then transitions. Now, what's interesting about this is you can see murder, covetousness, adultery, right? Those are all commandments that we see in the, in the Ten Commandments. But then he connects that with, with the people. He says, you adulterous people. And this is going to be a really interesting connection that we'll delve into a little bit later. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Another rhetorical question there. Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. 
Well, remember earlier in the book of James, how James says that Abraham was called a friend of God because he had faith and his works backed up that faith. Well, this is the opposite, where you are a friend of the world and an enemy of God. Or do you suppose it is no purpose? It is to no purpose that the scripture says, he yearns jealousy, jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us. Another rhetorical question. Now, actually, this last verse uh, here in James that we just read, this is verse, uh, verses 5, or J James 4, 5, is one of the more controversial verses in the whole book. And uh, it has some, some both uh, textual critical issues, uh, but also primarily trying to find where this citation comes. Because it does say, the scripture says, and as, as the English translation here uh, shows it as a, as a citation, we'll, we'll, we'll look at that later. Where does the citation come from and how does it relate? Uh, and there's, a, there's also an interpretation issue. Who does it refer to? Who is the he? Who is jealous? Is that positive or is that negative? Um, and there's different uh, interpretations uh, on, this, on, this, on this passage. But again, we'll, we'll look at that a little bit later. And then we enter this last section. It says, but he gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And this starts that string of commands or imperatives that James gives uh, something like nine of these uh, I think uh, nine or seven, depending how you uh, divide it up. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched, and mourn, and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning, and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. That's James 4. 1 through 10. And just uh, as long as I have this, um, this, the whole text on the screen, and I'm a, I'm a big fan of studying the Bible in this way and trying to quantify how the uh, discourse of the author is, 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 is drawing us into this narrative. How is, how is he putting this stuff out? Like how, how does the text work together? And as you can clearly see, and as I mentioned before, you have these rhetorical questions all leading us to these imperatives or these commands uh, that are listed here at the end. Now, one, uh, one minor thing, um, just because just I have it listed here, is the fact that he talks about, in, in the green there, the subjunctive mood. Now, you might say, what is a subjunctive mood? Well, that's talking about the speaker's attitude towards something that he is saying. So it's different than an imperative, but he says, be wretched and mourn and weep. And then he says, let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. So that reflects his attitude. So it's kind of a digression about that particular command that he gave. So that's our, that's our text. Um, and we're going to take this piece by piece and delve into some of the details. So the first thing that uh, really jumps out at the beginning is the uh, element of, of fighting, the element of, of, of warfare. In fact, it says war and fight fights. Uh, and the obvious thing to note is, uh, well, the first thing we should ask is, who is, uh, who is James talking to? He's talking to, of course, believers in the, uh, in the Jewish community. Um, it's spread throughout the diaspora, as we've seen. Uh, and we've known about, um, earlier on in the text, we talked about how there were uh, fights, in the, uh, fights in the church, um, how sometimes the poor believers were brought before the magistrate. Uh, and we know of, of, of other issues that are hinted at through his discussion of the tongue, how there's forest fire blazes and how there's deadly venom and, and, and all of that. But he doesn't address this with specifics. He just simply says that there are quarrels and there are fights, and he compares it metaphorically to a, to a war. And he talks about this in, in the context of there being a passionate uh, conflict. And really, he's talking about these passions being within us, that we have these deeper problems, these deeper passions within our hearts that are causing us to, that are causing us to, to wage war with, with one another. Here's another look at uh, what he might have been thinking of when he talks about war, this are we preparing for war? Are we preparing to be at uh, to be at peace with one another? What is causing these fights? 
Well, after um, after saying this, after saying that it's really these these passions that are, that are drawing us in, he then gets into um, the, this larger issue, uh, or the and it's really an exposition of what these passions are. Really, our passions are tied to our desire. Our, our passions are just are tied to things that we want, things that we covet. Um, and he's going to bring together. Uh, the issue of our of our passions at war within us, which leads to all kinds of conflict in the uh, in the church body, but he's also going to bring in the Old Testament, and this is really what I um, so much appreciate about the Book of James, is that again and again we have this author appealing not only to a new uh, Christian ethic of love your neighbor as yourself, this royal law that. Jesus so much was a proponent of, which of course is not an, a new law, it's right there in the Old Testament, but he's also appealing to Old Testament law, the, the Ten Commandments as we see it here, the being to, to murder and, and to covet. Um, and, and, and so this passage, again, reflects that idea. And so what I want to do here is just to, to show how, um, on the one hand, these two things are related to... Um, how this passage is related to the Ten Commandments, but also how that in itself is connected with the Sermon on the Mount. And so let me go ahead and just reread this passage. You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. So right there you see two do nots. Do not covet, do not murder. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions, you adulterous people. So right there you have three out of the last five of the uh, moral uh, commandments. Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not covet. And very interestingly, we see these same, um, we see these same commandments, of course, addressed in the Ten Commandments. But also addressed in the Sermon on the Mount. By the way, I was just uh, in Houston at the Lanier Theological Library, and I had seen this before, but I hadn't taken a picture of it. I, I really like this uh, granite tablet. It's meant to be as close a reflection to what the Ten Commandments may have looked like as possible, uh, because it's, it's uh, actually carved into uh, the granite which exists in Sinai, and it's doing um, proto-Canaanite, that is, the type of script that the uh, Israelite or that the Canaanites would have used in, uh, in, in while they were in during during this period, so it's kind of a really cool artifact. Um, but back to this, you can see how these ideas are related: murder, covet, and adultery, and how they are related not only to what we're reading in James, how they're related to the Ten Commandments, but also how we see it on the Sermon on the Mount. And so, if we think about um, the, the 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 sources for James. He's drawing on the Ten Commandments as this big ethic that uh, everyone has, but he's also seeing it through the prism of Jesus' interpretation of the Ten Commandments and the law as a whole. As we've seen in again and again, we have the Sermon on the Mount as the backdrop to much of what James' is teaching is all about. Now, what's so interesting to me, though, is that in this section, it's clear that in the first couple of verses, verses 2 and 3, you have James describing things that fit in very well with the commandment, but on the last point, he's actually changing his, uh, he's changing topics. He's, he's, he's really uh, referring, he's giving this, them this exhortation. He's, he's calling them out, you adulterous people. Um, and so this is actually going to do double duty. One, it's going to be a call back to the Ten Commandments, which is rooted in, in the Sermon on the Mount, but it's also going to be a way of connecting this terminology with uh, the the um, prophetic literature, in which Israel is constantly compared to an adulterous woman, which itself is a metaphor for idolatry, for serving other gods. That God is their husband, and they're worshiping other uh, other gods, and they're and they're, uh, they're not showing genuine allegiance to Him. But we'll look at that in a little bit later. Now, just just uh, again to see this in connection with uh, the Sermon on the Mount. Not only do we see it with Jesus in Matthew 5, where it says, You shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. Now you have heard it said, 
you shall not commit adultery. We also have this very obvious connection between this language of asking and receiving. And in and, and the last part of the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 7, we read how, how Jesus says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks and the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be opened. And we read that same thing in James. You ask and you do not receive because you ask wrongly. And so even the concept of how he's speaking, the language that he's speaking, is coming directly from our, our Lord, who spoke these words on the, Sermon on, uh, on the Sermon on the Mount, perhaps on the very mount that we're looking at in this, uh, on this aerial image. And this is just a reminder, once again, that much of the Sermon on the Mount is embedded in the book of James. I, I, I've shown this before, but I, I want us to, to look just real quickly here at how much of chapter 4 is, uh, is really pulling on different aspects of the Sermon on the Mount. So if you look here, you can see my mouse pointer. You see uh, verses 2 through 3, 4, 9 through 10, 11, 12, 13 through 14. All of these find an expression in the Sermon on the Mount. And so right here in the in, in kind of the center towards the end of the book um, and right throughout the Sermon on the Mount, these ideas are coming back to things that Jesus were talking about. Now, there's a few other things that we'll see in chapter 5 that are that are obvious uh, parallels as well. But I would say, on the whole, chapter 1 and chapter 4 have the most parallels between what we see in uh, the Sermon on the Mount and what James is talking about, even in terms of the structure of his epistle. And so, again, it's just something to keep in mind as we're looking at this. Now, to, to delve a little bit deeper... Um, and, and even think about a, an example of someone who murders, and someone who covets, and how, how obvious these things are in terms of their connectedness. In other words, that someone who murders often is someone who is coveting. Let's look at the example of David with Bathsheba and Uriah the Hittite. Now, those of you who know the story, who might know it well, we remember that David looked out from his, uh, from his palace. He should have been fighting at war, but he, re he refused to go for whatever reason. And he looked out and saw Bathsheba bathing. He, he brought her to his house. He committed adultery. She becomes pregnant. And trying to cover up the sin, he brings Uriah home, hoping that she will sleep, that they will sleep with one another, and then cover up this, uh, cover up this sin. He refuses to do so. He shows himself more holy than, uh, than David. And David actually tries to get him drunk and this whole thing. And eventually at the end, after Uriah won't do what David wants him to do, he sends him to the battlefield with his own death warrant, telling Joab, the commander, to put Uriah at the forefront of the battle so that God, uh, so that um, the enemies will strike him down. And so in the next chapter, we have Nathan the prophet saying the following, Why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword, and have taken his wife, uh, his wife to be your wife, and have killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. And so I, I think that there's really no better example. Perhaps even James has these in mind. I mean, if, if you're trying to think of a sermon illustration, there's no better example than what, than what David does here, um, that he commits both of these things. And, and I think there's um, on, on the one hand, this is discouraging, but it's also encouraging. It's discouraging in that someone like David, who has God's spirit living inside of him, um, and is this awesome hero of the faith and does so many wonderful things, can commit such heinous uh, sin. Uh, and yet, that's exactly what James is talking about. This is addressed to believers, this whole epistle. Um, and so much of the... Uh, much of the, the teaching is, is, to, to, is to believers, not an exhortation to unbelievers. And so he's dealing again and again with this tension of how do we live in light of the call to be, to be, followers, of, uh, to be followers of Jesus? How do we do that? Well, what he sees many times is that we fill um, the pool of the world. We fill the, the call to, to not follow completely. Uh, and this gets back all the way to what he addressed in chapter 1, that we're called to perfection, not perfection in the sense of 
never committing sin, but perfection in the sense of, of completeness. That's what he draws on in, uh, in chapter one. And, and that's where I'd really like to, to go to here. And here I have up here the passage that we, that we just asked and specifically thinking about asking wrongly to spend it on your passions. And think about that in connection with James 1, verses 5 through 8. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man and unstable in all his ways. And so as that chapter, that, that, and, and particularly those uh, first few verses, set the stage for much of the book, here we have it coming back again in this central section where much of the teaching is being, um, is being exposited. And, and the point really is this. The point really is this, that we, that we need to, uh, we, we need to uh, think about how God is wanting us to live, that we need to live a life marked by faith and, and, and faithfulness. Now, we often think about that. That simply just means belief, that we believe simply in what God has, um, God has asked us to do. But that's often not the case, uh, what, what James is saying here. But we, we can focus a lot on asking and asking uh, with, uh, with, with, with faith. But the point is, is that we're asking not to, uh, for God to give us a nice house or God to give us a 401k or God to give us a Corvette or, or whatever the, the idea is. But instead, he is asking to, um, they were asking for wisdom. They were asking for the ability to follow him completely and, and wholly. And that is what he's talking about, is that if we ask we will receive, but we have to ask rightly, or we have to ask without reproach or, or, or in faith, and it, therefore it contains this uh, same idea. Well, we also see, and, and as we transition to this uh, to this next section, we also see how um, in, in, in um, this this next verse of, of this next section in James in James uh, four. We see how he says, you adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose it is no purpose that the scripture says he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us? So just give me one second. I'm going to try and get my video back. On, go. Sorry about the interruption. There I am. There we go. Oh. Sometimes that can be finicky. Yes. So, what's so interesting about this uh, opening line is that this as I said before, is, is tied to what we often read in the prophets. Uh, we read about this, for instance, in, in Jeremiah 3, where it says, Surely as a treacherous wife leaves her husband, so you have been treacherous to me, O house of Israel, declares the Lord. Now, this idea of connecting uh, Israel's covenant infidelity with adultery, and then really that Covenant infidelity was about idolatry, which is a nice, uh, which is a nice coincidence in English that idolatry and adultery sound similar. Um, is is something that pervades Judaism and pervades prophetic uh, prophetic literature. And as we said before, this is nice because it ties into the Ten Commandments, but it also takes us towards his his next point. That if you don't follow the commandments, if you don't follow and do what God has called us to do you're really expressing that you are serving the world, that you are serving the powers of darkness that, that rule over uh, this world. And if that's the case, then you are actually an enemy of God. A friend of the world is an enemy of God. And, and we're doing the opposite of what our father Abraham uh, was doing. That is, he was a friend of God. 
And then we'll look at, again a little bit later at this uh, at this bigger question at the end of the section uh, about how uh, about how that jealously passages or relates. And so just to, to, to connect this with, it says in, the, in our current passage, do you know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Anyone who is a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. And then pointing back to James 2, 23, it says the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. And he was called a friend of God. And so if you could really boil down James into uh, one teaching, one of the ways you could do it is you could at, at the end say, am I a friend of the world or am I a friend of God? Um, and in his, in his exposition, being a friend of the world means living a life marked by faith. And if we're to follow faith to its, uh, to its end and use the example of Abraham, that included even obeying God to the point of, of believing him about sacrificing his own son as we look on at both Isaac and Abraham and their wives, as well as Jacob and his wife, uh, burial ground in, in Hebron. Now, this, this passage also reminds us, uh, you know, friendship with the world is enmity with God. It also really obviously reminds us of, of, of Jesus' teaching on the Sermon on the Mount, where he says, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. So again, another look at the area of Mount, Mount of Beatitudes. And so again, his, his teaching often is against the issue of being double-minded, being double-hearted. That is, trying to live in, in a world in which you have tension between serving the world and serving God. Now, in reality, this is going to happen to all of us. We all commit sin, but... It's not some place that we're supposed to be comfortable in, that we have stuff that's partly world and partly God. That, that's not the case. We have to live lives that are wholly and completely in service to God. Now, what's uh, again, is so encouraging about this is that this is scattered throughout James's teaching, not only in his book, but also in uh, Acts 15, where we have James stand up in the Jerusalem Council. And so in our current passage, as I've said, it says friendship with the world is enmity with God. Whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. This reminds us very much of one of the most memorable passages in James at the end of, 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 uh, of chapter 1. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this. We focused on visiting orphans and widows in their affliction. But the overlooked passage, it says, and to keep oneself unstained from the world. That is... It's just as important as visiting widows and orphans, holy living. Uh, and that's something we can often forget um, as, we, as we try rightly to uh, care for those who need the utmost care. We have to have our lives marked by, uh, marked by holiness. And this too reminds us exactly what he says again in Acts 15, after Paul stands up and gives his testimony. James replies, really giving the uh, judicial response to it. Therefore, my judgment is that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God, but should write to them to abstain from things polluted by idols and from sexual morality and from what has been strangled and from blood. For from ancient generations, Moses has had in every city those who proclaim him, for he has read every Sabbath in the synagogues. Now, I wanted to bring this out because I think it says even more explicitly. If we are following our passions, James is telling us is that we are actually following the path of darkness. We're following the, the, the powers of the earth, which he'll say later is, is the devil. And so even though we might not be going to the uh, temple of Athena or the temple of Apollo or wherever we are in the Greco-Roman world, or in our current context, we might not be going to a Buddhist temple and praying there or worshiping there uh, or other, what other pagan deity there is. He is equating that lack of allegiance we have in our actions towards God with the same type of uh, idolatry. Or really, I, I think this is important for us to see, that idolatry uh, is not just something that exists in itself. It's actually a lack of allegiance to the Lord. Um, and so he is saying that's why you don't eat things polluted by idols. 
uh, and he puts sexual morality between that and things strangled and things associated with blood. Because all of those are signs that you are not following the Lord, that you're not taking him seriously. Now, as we move into this uh, next section, I love this, uh, this image taken from Mount Sinai at uh, sunrise. Uh, there's, some, there's some really interesting things here. And, and as I said before, James 4, 5 is a, uh, probably the most problematic uh, verse in the, in, in the text because it's, it's difficult to understand uh, who it's referring to and whether or not it's negative or positive. Some passages uh, connect it with, with people's jealousy, which would, of course, be negative. Uh, people's jealousy, jealousy, unless they're talking about uh, spouses in the Bible, uh, is, never, is never good. But God's jealousy is always uh, d- described as, as good. And so let me read the translation, and this comes from the ESV. Um, and notice how it's actually quoting the scripture, which I actually find interesting too, because James only quotes a few times um, specifically, although he oftentimes is applying other scripture. But quotes, uh, citations, and in both places, he's talking about being a friend. So one is a friend of the world, and, and the other is the friend of God. And, and the friend of God, of course, he's referring back to Genesis. Here, I think it's pretty clear that he's referring back to Exodus. And I would follow the view that this is positive, that it refers to divine jealousy. And so it says, or do you suppose it is to no purpose that the scripture says, he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us. Now, that, unfortunately, (laughs) or for whatever reason, that's not quoted, or I should say, that's not written anywhere in the Bible. So we can't find this, uh, this citation in the Old Testament, but most uh, would, would conclude that this so-called citation is a kind of interpretation of what is being said in Exodus, uh, Exodus 20, which is the, uh, the giving of the Ten Commandments, and also some other passages that talk about similar, uh, similar things. So I'm going to read uh, Exodus 20, verses 4 through 5. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is heaven above, or that is in earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth, you shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, Yahweh your God, am a jealous God. Now, given the fact that he has just talked about covetousness and murder and adultery, it makes sense that he would be referring back to this. And so he's saying that God yearns jealously for his people to worship him in spirit. They would worship him uh, because of who he is and how he has called them into this covenant relationship with him. And so specifically, if they make carved images, if they worship these other likenesses, they're worshiping other gods and they're not worshiping him. And so that's that's really clear. But w- one of these aspects that isn't really clear, if, if we're just talking about an Old Testament uh, theology, is that they don't actually have the spirit. They don't actually have the spirit once they uh, are following in this covenant relationship. And without getting into questions of how Old Testament saints became uh, saved and, and believed, um, that, let's leave that on the side. I, I think what James is, is doing here is, is really interesting because he is connecting the Sinai covenant with perhaps the Jeremiah New Covenant language. And remember, it says up there, you know, you adulterous people. Let me just read. Uh, a section from the New Covenant in Jeremiah 31. Behold, the days are coming, declares Yahweh, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. So that's what we just read about. They're taken out of the land of Egypt, they're taken to Sinai, they're given a covenant. This is what you do to follow God. Uh, we have the building of the uh, of the tabernacle, we have the uh, creation of our, all of its in, its vessels and instruments. We have the establishment of the priesthood and so on. But this covenant is that they broke, though I was their husband. So a, a reference clearly to adultery, just like we just read in, in James, declares Yahweh. For this is the covenant, he's talking about a new covenant, that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares Yahweh. 
I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts. I will write it on their hearts. So this is a reference to this coming covenant, which by James's day has already arrived. That covenant comes with Pentecost, with the outpouring of the Spirit, which is connected with other Old Testament passages, such as Joel 3, Joel, Joel, the end of Joel 2 and Joel 3, which Peter talks about in, uh, in, that, um, in, in, in his great uh, sermon at Pentecost. And so we put that together then, when it says, he yearns jealously, he's referring to God yearning over his people to follow him and be in this right relationship with him, and to have no other gods, no other passions that, that they're allegiant to, and that he's compounding it with the reality uh, that he is now experiencing, that he has now lived through, perhaps in, in, we, we know from Acts, experienced firsthand, the, the outpouring of the Spirit that they now have, that is now dwelling in them, dwelling in us, as he says. Uh, and so it's this connection both with himself and the larger diaspora of those Jews who believe, and of course we thank the people that it has come to Gentiles as well. And so I think that even though this is a difficult passage, if we are careful with it and we see what he's really saying here, it's, it's really quite uh, important and, and revolutionary. Well, this is where we get into the second half of the passage. We're not going to spend as much time on this because it's fairly straightforward what he is uh, doing here. Let me go ahead and just read it from the, from the top down, and then we'll make our way through and just make a few comments. But he gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And so what he's saying here is he gives more grace. He's giving more grace to sustain and to not follow the way of the world. He then quotes Proverbs 3.34, and we'll look at that in just a second. He then lists these imperatives. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. Now, what I, what I really love about this, uh, this section is it starts with a guiding principle, a guiding principle of how God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. It then gives you a roadmap to how you become humble. Submit yourselves, resist the devil, draw near to God, cleanse your hands, be wretched, mourn and weep. And then that means you humbled yourselves and God will exalt you. And so each one of these imperatives builds on itself like a, like a chain link, uh, much in the same way that we see in the Sermon on the Mount with the Beatitudes, how poor in the Spirit builds to the next one and so on until you end with those who are uh, uh, hungering and thirsting after after righteousness. And so there's this built-in um, character response to how you do each one of these things that I think is, is, is quite powerful when we look at it. And so let me just say a few things about uh, about the, the specifics that he talks about. The first thing he says is, uh, cleanse your hands, you sinners. And, well, let me, let me go back here for just a second. Let's see, that's my slide. Oh, yeah, I got my slides out of order. Uh, the first thing I wanted to say is about this, uh, this reference to, um, this reference to Proverbs 3.34. Now, the interesting thing is, uh, and this is just a, a you know, a, a thing to note, that oftentimes when New Testament writers are citing the Old Testament, they're citing the Septuagint. And this is a good example, because we can, you can open up your Bible to Proverbs 3.34, and you'd read the following. Toward the scorners he is scornful, but to the humble he gives favor. That conveys much of the same idea that we see in James, but the language is actually exactly what we read in the Septuagint, which is what I have there next. The Lord resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And in James 4... God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Same idea. And this is actually quoted also by Peter, also using the Septuagint, showing then that the Bible of the apostles, by and large, is the Septuagint and not the, uh, and not the Hebrew Bible, not the Masoretic text, although they probably would have been familiar with that as well. And, and he says, Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another, for God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time 
he may exalt you. Uh, and, and again, it, it's, it's really always encouraging to, ha to hear um, these pillars of the church say exactly the same thing. In this case, Peter uses the exact same passage to make the same point about humility. And here's just a look at uh, uh, an artistic representation of Peter um, from the day. You can actually read Petras and Paulus uh, with the key row uh, for, for Christ right there on this, uh, on this inscription, a later inscription. Now, if we go back, kind of you got things out of order. Okay, now back to this to this point. Oh yes, here we are. Um, this threefold or this threefold attack or this threefold um, imperative at the beginning it says, submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. I can't help but think that these three imperatives are, are drawing on Jesus's actions and attitudes throughout his ministry, but particularly in the temptation. Notice this same language. You can read the whole passage in Matthew 4. I won't do it, but notice the same, the same character that our Lord has and uses. He, the devil, said to him, all these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Remember, Jesus has been driven into this wilderness by the Spirit. He submitted to the Spirit's urgings. And the devil has gone through, this is the final temptation in Matthew. He gives him, shows him all the kingdoms of the earth. Fall down and worship me, and I will give these to you. Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him. So he, he resists the devil, and he flees from him. Not only that, Behold, angels came and were ministering to him. Literally, we have God drawing near to Jesus through the, through the angels and through these ministering, uh, through these ministering spirits. And so it's uh, again just a uh, another clear example of how if we follow the Lord's path, if we follow the Lord's uh, manner of life, and it's unlikely we'll be driven into the wilderness and face this type of temptation. But if we follow it in terms of principle, the results are there. And so it's both, a, it's both about the method of how we do it, but also God promises results, which is always a good thing. He then talks about, in this, in this, next, uh, in this next section, cleansing your hand uh, and purifying your hearts, you double-minded. Um, this is interesting because it draws on language from uh, the book of Numbers. Now, in the Old Testament, this idea that you cleanse your, your hand, you cleanse your, your garments, you cleanse your, your body is connected with the Levitical, um, the Levitical tabernacle, how things have to be purified with the water for impurity to become clean. Now, by the time of Jesus, this has been extrapolated to the point that everything has to go through some type of ritual water purification. And so oftentimes, um, Jewish believers or I should say Jews are, are spending um, lots of time in these types of, of ritual baths, not as a result of becoming hygienically clean, but become, becoming ritually, uh, ritually clean. Um, and in, in, again and again in the, in the Gospels, we find Jesus encountering this, uh, encountering this issue. Uh, for instance, in this passage in Matthew 15, it talks about how the Pharisees and the scribes came to Jerusalem from Jerusalem, and they're questioning him, why don't your disciples wash their hands? Now they say, the, the traditions say we have to wash our hands, we have to go into the mikvah, we have to do all these things. And Jesus, I think, answers quite, um, quite tellingly in speaking to the, to, to the true teaching that he is often espousing. And why do you break the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? For God commanded, honor your father and mother, which again is another commandment, and whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. But you say, if anyone tells his father or his mother what you would have gained from me is given to God, he need not honor his father. So for the sake of your tradition, you have made void the word of God. I think that's a very important line to understand much of what Jesus' teaching is in the Gospels, particularly the Synoptic Gospels, that his criticism, with particularly the scribes and Pharisees, is against their hypocrisy of demanding that you follow the traditions and not following the spirit of the law. That the traditions actually 
uh, cause you not to be able to follow the spirit of the law. Or in Mark's, uh, in Mark's language, that you've nullified the word of God with your tradition. And so when we read James say that we have to wash our hands, cleanse our hands, and purify our hearts, it's both a connection back to what the point of ritual purification was all about, but also the reality that we need to have genuine uh, repentance. We need to repent and mourn over the sin that we have uh, committed. Uh, and, this, and this is not a New Testament uh, um, reality in and of itself. We see it really all throughout the Old Testament. Um, we can think of uh, Psalm 24, you know, give us clean hands and, and pure hearts. Uh, we can think of uh, 1 Samuel 15, that, um, that the obedience is better than sacrifice. Um, all of these texts speak to this reality that there's a deeper moral to what God wants and commands than we often, than we often think. Now, another interesting thing that, um, that I always find interesting to, to look at is that um, when we, we're, we're not judged like the Egyptians. Um, and, and actually, the Egyptians have the, the best, um, the, 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 the most explicit uh, thinking about the afterlife. Uh, this is a model of the Book of the Dead. And in it, you see uh, Anubis, um, the god of the afterlife and of souls, uh, bringing, you can see this uh, person uh, there on the left with their, with their hand coming before uh, Thoth, which you'll see in just a second, who is recounting all of the things they did in their life. Uh, and you have Anubis weighing the heart, which is in this canopic jar, against a feather. Uh, and if the feather, uh, if it's the same, or if the, the heart uh, goes out of balance, they are given to this monster named Amit, who is half crocodile, or is a, a, quarter, a third crocodile, a third lion, and a third hippopotamus, all the things that they could encounter uh, in Egypt that would eat man. That's who you will be fed to. Uh, and, and you can see Thoth over here recounting those deeds. Now, what that basically is, is, is a kind of works righteousness that you, whatever your works are on earth, they outweigh the bad things. That is not what James is espousing. That's not, of course, what the New Testament espouses, but it's often important to, uh, to, to compare not only uh, the world in which we live in, but really the world of the ancient world and how they thought about how someone uh, achieves righteousness and holiness. That's not the point. It's about your genuine commitment uh, to, to the Lord. And here's where I'd, I'd like to just draw on um, kind of a larger theme in the book of, of James, this idea of being double-minded, being double-minded. And, and we talked about this in, in chapter 1. Go back in uh, chapter 1, 8 and, and see that. But it, it's really this, this constant theme that runs throughout. Uh, it probably is connected with uh, Psalms and Proverbs language. We pointed out already Psalms 12, 2, how everyone who utters lies to his neighbor with flattering lips in a double heart, they speak. Uh, we, we, we said how James kind of comes up with this word by himself. It really means double-souled. Uh, you can't be double-souled and be pulled one way or the other. You have to be single-minded. Uh, but it's also encouraging to, to read this in Second Temple literature. Now, this particular, um, this particular passage is very similar to what we read in the book of James. This comes from the Testament of the Twelve Patriarchs. This one is from, actually, the Testament of Asher. And just see if you can see some similar language. But do not ye, my children, wear two faces like to them, of goodness and of wickedness, but cleave to goodness only. For God hath his habitation therein, and men desire it. But from wickedness flee away, destroying the evil inclination by your good works. For they are double-faced. They serve not God, but their own lusts. Think how similar that is to what we've read in chapter 2, uh, that, you, that you are worshiping yourself, really. you're following yourself. But it's not just that, so that they may please Belier. Now, Belier is another name for Satan. We read that same language in 2 Corinthians 6, 15. And men like to themselves. For good men, even they that are of a single face, though they be thought by them that are double-faced to sin, are just before God. So just as James tells us that we are to have a single-mindedness to follow God wholly and completely, 
um, the, the wisdom, uh, or I should say the testament of the 12 patriarchs, gives instruction about how people are, uh, who, who are uh, desiring to both serve God and serve themselves, which in itself is, is serving the evil one. And so it's encouraging to see that this, this idea is not just in the book of James, it's in the Old Testament, but it's also in holy literature, stuff that doesn't become part of, of, of uh, the Bible, but it's the same type of thing that we read in both of these places. And then lastly here, he tells us to be wretched and mourn and weep, um, and, and our laughter be turned to mourning and our, and our joy to gloom. Now, uh, much as we read in the Sermon on the Mount, this is not just simply a statement about being mourning is good in of itself, but it is tied to a, an understanding that you have sinned and that you need to have genuine repentance, that you're mourning over your wrong behavior and you're yearning for right behavior. Uh, and so this is exactly with what we see in, um, in much of the Old Testament. We also see it in, in Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount. Consider what Jesus says. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Um, it really makes no sense to apply this to every situation. Um, I guess in some sense, mourning is part of the, um, mourning is part of the grieving process, um, for thinking of the death of a loved one, which is maybe what many of us think of. But what he's talking about is mourning over your wrong behavior being poor in spirit, being meek, inheriting the earth, all those things, and then mourning is right there. And then once you, once you mourn, then that leads to this genuine connection with being his follower. And that's the same thing that, that, um, that James is talking about, that we are wretched, we are mourning, and we are weeping, and that our countenance, which seems to be happy-go-lucky, our laughter, as he says here, that we're fine with the world, we're doing everything uh, whatever way we want, and saying we're a follower of God, meanwhile we're a follower of the world, that all that needs to be turned to gloom. It needs to be uh, to take on this air of, uh, uh, of certainty that we have not met the mark. Um, and for me, this so much speaks to uh, the, the, the language of the book of Joel, where Joel is calling on people who have experienced this locust plague to, to weep and wail and mourn um, and to show this type of, of, of remorse over their sin. And then he gets to the heart of the issue where he says, rend your heart and not just your garments and turn to the Lord your God. And in Joel, 2, Joel 1 and Joel 2, we see that same thing. After doing this, after they've humbled themselves by recognizing their sin, they come to God and God heals their land. And so it's that same process. There it's done corporately. Uh, in, the case of, in the case of James, it could be both corporately, but especially individually, that is a process that we need to see uh, very clearly. And then, and then here, we see how it's all linked. We start with Proverbs 3.34, about God opposing the proud, giving grace to the humble, and how that all comes in at the end. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. The path to exaltation is the path of humility. We all want to be exalted, but the way to exalt ourselves is against the way of the world. The way of the world is the way of Satan, who exalted himself above all. That is the way that we are tempted in our flesh to, to follow, tempted in the wisdom of the world to follow. Whereas God is saying to, to, to humble ourselves, is, is he gives us the grace to do so. He gives us the grace to act like that. And once we do it, God will exalt us, which is the same thing Peter says. And as we think about this, again, there's no better example than our Lord Jesus Christ in this very famous and very important passage in uh, Philippians. Do nothing from selfish ambition, uh, ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. Being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself, even to the, uh, by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. 
Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Notice that language that we saw in the second commandment. Don't make for yourself a graven image. Things above the earth, on the earth, or under the earth. It's about principalities of darkness, deities, uh, who Israel was, was wanting to worship. God in Christ is being exalted above all of these. And so again, we see a connection uh, all the way back to these commandments of allegiance. And every tongue that confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, Lord of all, to the glory of God the Father. And so the example that we cling to is the example that's, that's happened and yet will still happen when this great coronation scene that we all long for is the way that we follow this is to follow the path of Jesus, is that his path of humility ends in exaltation. Ours does as well. Well, in conclusion, let's briefly look through what we've discussed. We started with a question. What causes quarrels? And he answers. It's our passions at war within us, our desires to, to, to covet, to, to murder, and how this is connected with breaking God's uh, commandments. Uh, he, po he points out that uh, if we ask, we don't ask um, according to wisdom, um, that we're asking in vain we won't, and we won't receive. He then says, and di really digresses to that point, and says, if we are continuing to stay in that reality, our friendship is with the world. And that actually results in covenant adultery, uh, that we are following after uh, something that we're we're breaking our allegiance, breaking our oath to follow our Lord. So if we are a friend of the world, we are disloyal to God. If we are a friend of the world, we are an enemy of God. Uh, we then learn that God does not, of course, doesn't like this, but he is earnestly wanting us to, to, to follow him because he's given us our, uh, he's given us the spirit. We talked about how that likely reflects the second commandment, the following of God, of, of, of him being a jealous God, but it also is connected to the idea of the new covenant, how he's poured out his spirit upon us. We then saw in this last section how humility is the path to exaltation. The principle is, is rooted in a citation in Proverbs 3.34, that God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. He then lists in uh, really almost like chronological order what we're supposed to do. Submit to God, resist the devil, draw near to God, cleanse our hands and purify our hearts, mourn and be wretched and weep over our sin. And then finally, that's how we can become humble before the Lord. And once we do all that, we have lives characterized by that, God will exalt us in his, in, in his time, in his place, uh, in this age and uh, more likely in the age to come. And we pointed out that we have the best example of that in the form of, of Jesus and how he fits each one of these uh, each one of these steps. Well, next week we will look at um, the end of chapter four. It's a it's another uh, wonderful section of scripture, also connected with uh, the Sermon on the Mount in many ways, and it has a lot to do with presumption. It's another one of these memorable teachings that James gives us uh, about you who say, "I will go do in such and such." Uh, you should say, "If the Lord wills." And so we'll we'll look at that next time, if the Lord wills.